Hello, I'm Neil Dunning. I'm a member of the Brant County Woodlotters Association, and we are one of the chapters of the Ontario Woodlot Association. We're in Brant County, Brantford, Haldeman, and some parts of Hamilton as well. Today I'm going to introduce you to our walk and talk with Ron Kassir, and the subject is the American chestnut. So right now I'm at the woodlot that my wife and I bought in 2001. It's in Brant County in an area known as the Oakland Swamp. We are very fortunate to discover that we have one American chestnut tree. The American chestnut is a tree that once grew in huge numbers from southern Ontario right down to Georgia through eastern North America. It was very important for lumber, both for carpentry and for the fact that it was rot resistant and was great for things like posts. Also, I'm just going to stop to go over a fallen tree here. We had a big windstorm in southern Ontario yesterday. Also, the American chestnut produced huge amount of, uh, amounts of nuts which were eaten by wildlife and by people, our First Nations people and uh, settlers as well. Unfortunately, a blight came to North America and wiped out most of our chestnut trees by, well, the 1930s or so, I think most of the chestnuts were gone. And these trees grew to huge sizes. If you ever see a picture online, uh, there's some pictures online with people in front of the tree and they're just immense trees. Anyway, the blight doesn't kill the roots of the tree, so the tree's able to re-sprout and that's believed to be a reason why there are some of the remnants that we have. So now we're at the area of my woodlot where the chestnut is. These are some chestnut saplings. I'll tell you about those in a moment. This is the American chestnut here. Let me show you the bark to start with. And there's the tree. It's about 40 feet tall. Quite healthy. No signs of uh, sprouts coming out of the, the stump. And usually when sprouts start coming out, that means the tree's under stress. Under stress, there, there are no cankers on it, and the bark is clean. So, so far, so good. That's one of the leaves of the American chestnut. And we'll be having a closer look at, at the leaves later. So these are five small saplings, you can see the guards, and these are part of what's called the Breaking Isolation Project, and you'll be hearing more about that later in the video. We're at the farm of Ron Kassir, who's with the Elgin Middlesex chapter of the OWA. Also, Ron is the cha chair of the Canadian Chestnut Council, and I'm a board member, so I thought it'd be really great to come out here and learn about what the Kenyan Chestnut Council is doing at Ron's farm. You can see behind Ron here is uh, a research orchard. And Ron, can you tell us a bit about it? Okay, well, welcome everyone. So this research um, orchard was established back in 2011, and it's our, one of our, it is our smallest research station. Our larger one is at um, Onondaga Farms at the Tim Hortons Children's Camp in Brant County. Um, so this consists of approximately one acre with about approximately 2,000 American chestnut. Um, there's pure American, there's some hybrids, there's also some controlled trees like Chinese and European as part of the research process. And so these are all second generation trees, so they've been back crossed at least once um, from the original parents. And so we can these trees are, get to a certain size and then we inoculate them and I can show you some inoculations so that and see what the results that we're trying to 
achieve here. So um, this tree here is approximately five years old. It's reached its um, about two inches in diameter. And you can see here and here, we've made a small opening and we insert a plug of inoculum, which is contains the actual blight. We put the weaker blight on the bottom and the stronger blight on the top. And then we look for a reaction. Now you can see here this orange area and sunken area, that is the blight infection. And so we monitor these up to three years to see how the tree responds. Uh, right now, this tree is showing no response to fight off the infection. But again, in Canada here, we have a shorter growing season and therefore the tree has a shorter time span. So that's why we take up to three years before we decide whether a tree is kept in the breeding program or not. So what we have here is a tree that was tested six years ago. And you can see that the original mark for the boar is still there. The disease has kept spreading, but you can see this tree has tried some response. This callus that's formed here and under the bark on this side, but you know, you notice that the blight has eaten its way around. But this is one of the tree's mechanisms. But you can see the blight is moving down the trunk. So this has, tree has immunity or has resistance in that it can keep the blight from spreading around the tree laterally, but not vertically. And so this tree has, is of interest and it is surviving. It's also fighting off uh, natural occurring blight infections but it's not necessarily a tree that we're interested in because it's not showing. We want trees that form a complete callus. So we've got another example over here. So in this example, you can see the callus is very massive and it's come around, split over the bark here. And that's actually new bark growing back? Yeah, that's new bark growing back. And so we see another example here now this is a tree of interest. It's also from six years ago, but it's showing a much stronger resistance. And what we found in nature, trees that show this sort of resistance, over time, that scar will close. There's a tree at River Bend that had a scar that was at least two and a half feet long and probably six inches wide. And you can see where the tree has closed up and it's surviving. Every other American chestnut planted around it has died from the blight. And at Springwater Conservation Authority, there is a younger tree whose scar is like one inch wide and about 12 feet long, but it's slowly healing. So again, those are the trees that we want to pass on to our breeding program. Now this tree hasn't been, even though it's six years, we haven't passed it into the breeding program yet. We're still seeing, looking for better results and that. So in, I mentioned earlier that there were about 2,000 trees here. Genetic wise and statistic wise, if I find, we find 10 trees out of the 2,000 that have resistance, that's what the odds are. So when I established this plot, I knew that eventually I'd end up with an empty field with 10 trees. So, but we're coming along, things are, um, and this tree again, it's showing a natural blight or natural infection here. And again, it's healing it off. So again, this tree may prove to be, and the nice thing about this tree, you'll notice that it grows nice and straight and it forms a timber, would form a good timber tree. And I know the blight infection here is quite but ugly. <laughs> um, and that would impact the formation of the log. But again, this tree would be crossed with another F2 to create our F3s. And back in 1920, or in 2020, we uh, planted our first F3s out. And so, so now we've got about, um, we've got three years of F3s um, and we're expecting our F3s to show 
a high degree of resistance, if not total resistance. So this is a time for me, Ron, as a board member to get some education. What does F2 and F3 stand for? F2 and F3 is referring to the generation. So the original trees that we took from the original 26 families we started with, male and female, we crossed them and that produced the first generation of crosses. So the 26 families that were chosen were wild native American chestnut that were still surviving and therefore had somehow survived blight and any possible reinfection, uh, reinfection um, from back, well, blight went through here in about 1924. So they had st stood the test of time. From then we get our F1s. Our F1s were grown up in research plots like this and then they were tested with inoculum and the survivors from those tests, the best ones that showed the most resistance, we crossed them to make the F2. So you get a nursery like this. And from this F2, we're now testing. And from the best trees in here, we'll produce our F3s. So are there any F3s yet? Yes, there are there. F3s at Onondaga Farms, but not here yet. Okay. Um, our F3s are being planted in isolated pots because we want to make sure that we keep concentrating the genes for resistance into the best trees and we don't want it to be diluted out again. So the program is trying to concentrate. Uh, we originally believed there were three genes involved with um, resistance. Now there's possibly a fourth. So we've got to keep those four concentrated. We suspect that our native trees have one or two of the resistant genes. We're just trying to bring them together into a collection of trees that will show all four genes and then the blight will have been defeated. Hmm. So four genes that will, will give complete resistance. Yeah. Wow. So the genes we're looking at are genes that produce this callus. There are genes that resist, chemically resist the blight getting into through the bark at all. And there's probably other resistant genes, but those are the ones that we're kind of concentrated on. But we'll also look at, the other factor we're looking at again is hypovirulence, um, which saved the European chestnut. Hypovirulence is a virus that you give to the tree, infect the tree with, and the virus gives the blight the flu, for a better example. Um, and therefore, the weakened blight, the resistance in the tree can flight off the blight and push the blight out of it. So in North America here, we tried about 30 years ago with hypovirulence. And there didn't seem to be much results, but our survey in 2014 showed that there are three trees showing hypovirulence. One of them is just here in central Elgin as well. And so we've reopened the investigation. Uh, the problem with hypovirulence here in North America is, in Europe they were dealing with five to six strains of blight. Here in North America, we're with 200 plus forms of blight. Wow. So we have to come up with 200 plus forms of virus to help fight this out. But it's an area that we're going to reopen and reinvestigate. Um, it may take some time, but it gives us another, it's a, uh, a biocontrol on the blight. But again, it's something you put in your toolbox to help fight the blight to preserve the tree. When you inoculate these trees with blight, is it how many types of blight are in the inoculum? We use two different. We use a, a low virulent strain and a high virulent okay. strain. So that's why there's two things because we want to see can we get some resistance through using just low levels of or uh, low mortality and high mort mortality. So it's a, it's a test here and you can see the high mortality one here, the trees had more difficulty not as bad here.
But again, okay. this, the scientists haven't chosen this tree um, looking for something better um, because, of course, uh, doing this program takes a lot of time and a lot of money. So here's an inoculation test that's completely fail failed. You can see there's the puncture, there's the puncture. You notice that the orange of the blight has spread and the tree has made no attempt or very minimum attempt to survive. And so you can see this tree is now dead. Now the sucker is alive because of course blight will not go through the root system. So the one amazing thing about American chestnut is if the main trunk dies and there's sufficient sunlight, the root collar will send up additional branches and try to create another tree. And so you get this regeneration. So a stump can last for a long, long time. And so we find the biggest problem with this is that as the forest canopy closes in, eventually the stump gets shaded out and it can't regenerate that. And so the tree is lost. But, but that that's actually, the regeneration ability from the stump is partly what has saved the American chestnut. Oh, most definitely. We have a number of locations here in central Elgin uh, where there are small groupings of chestnuts that have survived that way. Uh, but in a forest situation, we've run into a thing of we need to do forest management around these older chestnuts so that they don't get um, shaded out because chestnut is a mid tolerant to shade. So they won't survive under complete shade. Okay, so just show you another example here. Inoculation site, inoculation site. You can see typical sinking, but notice the heavy callusing that's formed here. And this is a much smaller girth tree, but it's making a fairly strong response, which is what we're looking for. And it has also got a number of natural infections. So again, this is a tree of interest. We have to see how long it survives now. And it may be a tree for consideration for the breeding program to be incorporated into. And see here, this tree next to it, it's gotten a natural infection and it is on its way out. In fact, it's completely dead already, I can tell. Yep, it's dead. So in the research plot, Mother Nature does help us by removing trees that have no resistance. And so that helps speed, speed up the, the testing. And so you'll see trees, any gaps in the, the planting are trees that have been removed because they have shown no resistance. These trees go right down to Georgia, don't they? Oh yeah. And the interesting thing is, uh, recent, uh, recent research has shown that our trees here in Ontario have more genetic commonality with the trees in Georgia than they do with the trees in Ohio or New York, Pennsylvania, or even the ones up in north, the northeastern states. Uh, we're completely distinct from the Appalachia, and more research is showing that we, the population here, is very genetically very distinct and unique, separated from its American counterparts, hmm. um, which has drawn more importance to preserving our genome here. So it's very set to its our climate. And the neat thing about that is that we're finding that the original boundary was from basically Grand Bend to Oakville, south of that on the north shore of Lake Erie. But we now know we can grow American chestnut and produce viable nuts as far north as Sault Ste. Marie and at North Bay. So this tree will migrate northward with climate change and it's very suited to the Canadian environment. So that's another reason why we want to preserve uh, the tree. How did we end up with the same genome as Georgia? Probably how the tree migrated northwards Either the Canadian tree has been isolated for much longer and has done its own mut or mutated in its own fashion, or there's another migration route that has disappeared. 
like there's no intervening trees. Yeah. So, so somehow the trees came up the Mississippi Valley rather than oh, the okay. uh, Appalachia route. And who knows? But again, it's pure speculation. What is the maintenance on this orchard? Um, getting it established was probably the hardest part. Um, in the first year, uh, first three years, um, I watered um, by hand all of these trees um, at least once a week because, of course, the year we planted is the year we had a drought here <laughs> in this area. So uh, watering, um, part of the th thing we did here is we plant it with plastic. So that helped with weed control, but it meant mowing the in between here. Um, originally there was grass, but now with the shade it's turned to moss. But this gets mowed once a week. Um, I do go around and spray weeds to keep it out of the plastic. Um, taking out dead trees. Um, and in late June, we do I do hand fertilize these. Um, the other thing is you come in and uh, destroy gypsy moths, egg casings. There's a fair bit of manual stuff. Uh, here, because it's only an acre, it takes up a good chunk of my time. Now at Onondaga, where we've got probably closer to 15 to 20 acres, um, it, it's much more difficult to manage the areas. Um, but yeah, there's a, lot of, there's a lot of manual work. Watering is the biggest thing. Now it's mainly keeping the weeds down uh, taking out other things that are trying to because it's a little bit of a forest situation. So mulberry like moving in, dogwoods, a lot of stuff wants to grow. Of <laughs> and so you uh, spend time getting rid of trees that aren't supposed to be in the research plot. And it's just a thing of cleaning up. Um, and then but otherwise it's a, it's a labor of love and that so it's worth doing it's if I can save the tree. Were the gypsy moths bad this year? Um, not this year. Was oh, it about four years ago, five years ago? They were horrendous in here. But I discovered something. Baltimore Orioles love gypsy moth. Mm -hmm. And so I encouraged the Baltimore Orioles. I put out grape jelly and oranges <laughs> and it draws in the uh, Baltimore Orioles, or Northern Orioles, I guess that's the proper term now. Um, and they seem to, I haven't had a problem here um, since great. then. So that's one of the things. Uh, the other things that uh, I do leave nuts on the ground and that brings in the turkey. Turkey root around in here and that controls the greater and lesser chestnut weevil hmm. because one year we had weevil very badly in the in oh, the seeds. Oh, they dig into the nuts. And that they dig into the nuts and ruin it. Uh, but the weevils spend their pupil stage in the ground. And so with the wild turkey coming in now, they clean up the floor and I haven't had a weevil problem now. So that's part of that, that part of nature. And uh, I know the local hunters are always very keen <laughs> on the fact that this draws turkey. But um, I've had a flock as big as 27 birds in here, and it's only an acre. Yeah. And uh, this wow. year, uh, this year I had a grouping of uh, probably six or seven, and they I could hear them in here in the morning and at evening. But it also makes it a challenge if you want to get nuts. I've got to come out four or five times a day and hand pick. <laughs> Otherwise, in the morning everything is gone. <laughs> And you need the nuts for the breeding program. Well, right? nuts for the breeding program, but just even nuts to for display and even for consumption. And that the other thing, of course, being close to my own wood lot here, uh, the squirrels have discovered this. Now, there's a benefit to that in that the squirrels carry off nuts into the neighboring wood lots, mine and the ones across the road. And so in the long run, it's dispersing the seed out there. And you never know, Mother Nature may have crossed the right two trees together right. and create that tree you want, and it's growing out in the wild. Um, we find so. that at Onondaga, almost all the woodlots surrounding Onondaga have Amer young American chestnuts coming up now. And so one of them may hold the secret or the cure that we're looking for. Wow. So that's always, 
And again, and that's why we've uh, promoted, we have in the last uh, five or six years, we now have 39 uh, gene conservation seed colonies planted out on public land with conservation authorities and with land trusts. And what these consist of anywhere from 150 to 200 trees planted in a block and from that, once they reach sexual maturity, they will start cross-pollinating with each other and produce nuts, which will help the local wildlife. But in the same time, it spreads out that genetic combinations out into the neighboring forested areas. And so you get a reestablishment of the chestnut in the wild. And what we're doing is, now the blight may came, come in and it eliminate all some of those trees but we're hoping to get to the fruiting stage. And so that will allow for a recombination of the genetics. And again, mother nature might throw out the trees that we need to find. And so it expands our program. The other program we're running or doing is we've now established 61 trees with breaking isolation. These are trees that are isolated and chestnut needs two to tango. So it's not self-pollinating. So these trees have stood the test of time, haven't produced nuts in well over 100 years now, and what they're lacking is a partner. So what we've done is plant anywhere from 8 to 12 partners in the immediate vicinity of this mother tree. And the idea being that once they can pollinate each other, they will do recombination and start producing nuts. And so the process that's been developed to speed up the reproduction is, is called etolated grafting. And we take mature scion or cuttings from a mature flowering tree and it's grafted onto the undifferentiated plume of a seed, seed that's been germinated in the dark. And those two graft together and that resulting grafted tree will flower in its second year, sometimes in its first year. So what we've done is we've shortened the reproductive stage probably by about 14 years. And so these young grafted trees will start throwing pollen out. The mother tree will be raining pollen down on them. And so they'll be able to start producing nuts. And that gives a recombination. It also gives us a chance to preserve these trees in the wild that otherwise would probably die of old age and never produce nuts. So these trees, what you're seeing here, these holes, of course, are trees that have been cut off because they um, are not resistant to the blight. But here again, the root collar is sending up um, regrowth, regeneration, and so what I'll probably do is trim this down to one and let it come back up just for aesthetics. Uh, but these trees wouldn't be considered in our genetic program right now. Uh, the reason I don't destroy them is that you never know we may have missed something. And so you never want to destroy. It's why we keep our F1 nursery still around, um, even though we're not using them anymore. You never know when genetically you might have to step back. And I guess having grown up on a farm, you always heard about corn, how every once in a while they had to step back, the plant breeders had to step back and get some ancient gene from corn to fight a disease or an insect that had appeared in modern times. So again, this might be something that these trees might have a gene that we need in the future. And so we preserve them. See, this is Chinese here. You can see the difference in the leaf here. See, there's no hooks, and the serration is not as strong. And the shape of the leaf is also different. But it's got a, that, it normally would have a high glossy shine on it. These do interbreed with the American. Oh, yes. Right? And that, and we do have hybrids here, and that, so you will get intermediates. The idea originally was to, uh, breed an American chestnut that was 98% American and 2% Chinese with the Chinese resistant genes. And we're still doing that, but um, breeding a pure American chestnut using our native resistance, 
I think has, has now become our priority. Um, this is sort of the backup plan. Uh, although this was origi the original purpose was to develop as 98% pure American and using the ch um, Chinese resistance. But that was prior to us discovering that our native trees offered their own resistance. It was just too dilute for Mother Nature without help to uh, improve upon. So for those that are looking for American chestnut, that is a typical American chestnut leaf. And like its name implies, denata refers to the fact that the chestnut has a hook. So what you want to look for is at the end here, is that hook on the serration. So that hook is what you look for. The other thing to uh, distinguish Chinese from American, American has sort of a matte forest green, and Chinese will have a high glossy dark green. And that's when, one way. And of course the uh, horse chestnut, which is not related to the American chestnut at all, has a palmate leaf. So it's got like your five fingers on your hand. The leaflets are spread out and it's toxic, so don't eat it. <laughs> So Ron, um, I see there's these, these are the seed pods on the ground. Yep, those are burrs. And in them were, would be the chestnut fruit. Yep. And I understand that um, back in pioneer days, the chestnut was so abundant that people would collect wagon loads of these to eat? Oh yes, uh, there's lots of stories of the early, uh, chestnut was a big economic uh, driver. Uh, the chestnuts were sold at the local market. Um, guy I know in the west end of the county. Um, he tells the story that he collected chestnuts off his dad's farm before the blight went through and sold them at the London market and that paid for his degree at the University of Western Ontario. Wow. Um, and also whatever was left over they would let their hogs run through at the end of the season and of course your hogs that were fed on chestnut picked up a distinct taste and the Chicago market at one point would give a 50 cent per pound premium for hogs that were raised on chestnut because the ham had a very distinct taste. And of course chestnuts ground into flour which is um, gluten free. And so chestnuts were a big, big economy or part of the economy. The other important factor was chestnut wood. Um, in 50 years you can grow a tree large enough to be um, logged and lumbered and chestnut was the Ikea wood. Uh, it was used in everything from cradle to grave and that's the name it was given. Your cradle would be made of chestnut so would your uh, coffin. Um, it was used in all sorts of construction of houses and barns because it was very rot resistant, actually better than cedar and very long lasting on farms. It was used for split rail fences, for fence posts, telegraph, telephone, and even hydro poles were at one point using American chestnut. And of course, railroad ties for train tracks uh, hmm. didn't require any creosote. So the timber is very important. So part of our program is not only to bring back the economy of the chestnuts themselves, but bring back the economy of the uh, T timber itself. A uh, local guy there trying to preserve a historic church uh, in the west end of the county here and he was telling me how the interior of the church is all made of chestnut including the pews so it draws an interest there um, in trying to preserve that. Do we know how many chestnuts are in the wild now in Ontario? Um, the latest figure we have is about 2,000 and 384, I believe, is the number that the research has told us. Now, we still are finding chestnuts that are not recorded. Um, but you got to realize that prior to the chestnut blight coming into southern Ontario, there was between 1.5 and 2 million trees in southern Ontario. And one out of every four hardwoods in southern Ontario in the Carolinian zone was an American chestnut. Wow. And that, that's part of the ecological collapse. There's at least 250 or more species that
that were dependent on the chestnut um, for not only shelter and home roosting, but also for the food crop. Uh, chestnut is the only nut tree that produces a crop every year. Hickories, oak, walnuts have odd years where they don't produce. In some cases, it'll be two or three years between. So wildlife could depend on the chestnut. So with the demise of the chestnut, so demise a number of uh, populations of wildlife, including black bear, deer, uh, wild turkey, and of course it's historical link to the passenger pigeon. Um, but there was other relationships. Songbirds relied on it for nesting and therefore uh, when the songbird population fell, so did things like the goshawk was tied, its decline is tied to the American chestnut. Mm -hmm. So it, it's a very important tree ecologically as well. And that's part of our role is to try to restore that ecological, economic, and also the cultural role that it once played in uh, North America here. Well, Ron, thanks for having us out today. It's well, been really educational and interesting. Well, it's my pleasure. And if anyone wants to know anything more about the Canadian Chestnut Council. Uh, our website is Canadian Chestnut Council, all one word, dot ca. That's great. Thank you. Thank you for coming out.